Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth in Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net, right there. This is the interview show that gets deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format from FunkinStuff.net and also on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast edition from FunkinStuff.net, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and most leading providers. I'm your host, Scott Dr. G. X. Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide to Funk, which is available at Amazon.com. And whether you're listening or watching, I thank you very much for tuning in. My guest today is Tommy Jenkins, who since the mid-1970s has been an original member, a singer-songwriter of Cameo, which is not only one of the all-time great funk bands from an artistic standpoint, but also one of the most successful, having sold more than 20 million records. And one of the most unique characteristics of Cameo's distinctive sound has been its amazing vocals from Tommy. He supplied those through many years, and the group is for sure one of my very favorites. Tommy, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I hope you're doing good on this fine spring day. Absolutely. It's wonderful up here in the Bay Area. <laughs> ah, nice. Before we get into it, I wanted to share a little bit of how I got into Cameo way back. Um, for the first time, I heard Funk Funk on the radio from the debut album, Cardiac Arrest. In 1977, I was hooked. Heavily influenced by P-Funk, it signified the arrival of what Cameo itself would coin as C-Funk, and I was afflicted with a severe case of cameosis. From that point on and throughout the band's entire career into the 1990s, I bought every Cameo album on the day of its release before even hearing a note. Most of the time, I wasn't disappointed. The band released a dozen LPs from 1977 to 1986, culminating with the monster crossover success of Word Up. Every record packed at least one killer funk track, usually several, and at least one amazing ballad, along with many other delights. My personal favorite was 1982's Alligator Woman, and I had the pleasure of meeting Cameo's guitar player, Charlie Singleton, and Greg Johnson that year, and actually here's a, a memento from that, and Tommy's in the photo, but unfortunately, I don't know what you're doing that day, Tommy, but I, I somehow missed you that day in 1982 in Santa Monica, California. But uh, glad. Do you recall uh, the promotions for that at all? Uh, you know, I kind of lost you a little bit there, Scott. I froze, you froze on me. So uh, if you don't mind reiterating what you were just saying, I, uh, I lost you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, we lost your video there. Now we got it back. I was saying um, that back in 1982, I met Charlie and Greg, and it was part of the Alligator uh, promo tour and you weren't there you're in the picture but i was just wondering if you remembered that promo tour and just where the heck you might have been on that day uh in santa monica california but um i'm glad i caught up with you now but i missed you then yeah yeah and and i do not remember <laughs> <laughs> probably something better i hope yeah i saw cameo perform several times through the years but i was really uh you know the thing i'll never forget is seeing what I think was their first West Coast performance in 1977 or 78 time frame at the Hollywood Palladium. Mm. There was at least 10 band members on stage. The show was a wild tangle of generating bodies and frenetic energy and sounds. It predated the kind of you know organized chaos that was a hallmark of a band like Fishbone. Mm. A few years later, Cameo streamlined itself by forsaking a horn section in favor of heavy, heavier keyboards and synths. That's a hard word to say since. <laughs> As was the way moving into the 1980s, but they never lost their original and special sound or knack for creating or generating catchy hooks. So with that backdrop, let's find out more, much more about Tommy Jenkins, his contributions to funk lore, his solo career, what is up to nowadays. Tommy, are you ready to dive in? Let's go. All right. So I want to go way back uh, to start with, you know, um, where you grew up, um, what kind of childhood did you did you have, 
uh, how did musical become such a strong influence and get front and center in your life? Well, I grew up in New Jersey, a uh, small town called Rock. Uh, about 10 miles from New York City. And uh, it was a nice little town, more like a village, you know, 35, 40,000 people, you know, back then. And uh, one high school, you know, kind of kind of town, but it was uh, very close knit. Everybody knew everybody, of course. And um, in my family, my mom is a singer and she was basically a uh, gospel, you know, uh, Baptist singer. So her mom was not having her go uh, into the pop realm or any type of professional uh, area like that, even though she could have. And in my home, I listened to, my dad played uh, Sarah Vaughn, Duke Ellington, Frank Sinatra, you know, uh, a lot of the greats, a lot of the jazz greats. So I pretty much grew up in a jazz household. But my own musical background came. And back then I was I was singing with a couple of guys and friends of mine who we had a, a group we used to sing on the street corners and at parties and things like that, uh, about four of us. And our favorite songs were those by the Delphonics, the Intruders, uh, Marvin Gaye, Stevie. You know, those were my heroes growing up. And not only did I, especially Marvin and Stevie, because of the, the lyrical content, I really got into what they were saying uh, and the, the musical tapestry that they, we, that they weaved with their, uh, with, uh, with their instrumentation and where they came from lyrically and, and musically. So that's where my introduction was. And later on, I got into rock, you know, I mean, Grand Funk Railroad, uh, Steely Dan, um, uh, uh, Santana, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the rock groups. So my musical, uh, my musical history was varied. I didn't just stick to one genre. And coincidentally, when uh, I met Larry uh, in 19, I was 18 years old when I met Larry uh, in a club in Queens. And he was just starting to, he was just disbanding a group that he had already been in East Coast. And he was looking for, to, looking for some cats to start a new group. So I just happened to be there. I was dating a girl who was also in a band and I was talking to the manager who happened to know Larry. And he said, well, I know a guy. He asked me what I was doing. I said, hey, you know, I'm just hanging out with my girl. He said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a singer. And he said, well, I know a guy who's starting a band and uh, he's looking for some singers. I can introduce you. So the next day, uh, Larry came. I remember, I'll never forget it was uh, Memorial Day. And he came. And I remember seeing this guy with a big Panama hat, <laughs> big hat, you know, and I knew he was something special because it had to be a musician. Nobody dressed like that back then, you know, unless you were some kind of, you know, uh, uh, in, in the band, in a band or something. And we got to talking and I joined his group along with Gregory Johnson was the, one of the holdovers from East Coast. And we started the New York City Players. And that's how, that's how we became, would be the precursor to Cameo. So did you play in many other uh, bands before that or did you kind of really get no. feet wet with that? Yeah, no, I didn't play in any bands. I was just basically, uh, singing with my boys on the corner, you know, in the parties. And actually I did a couple of uh, attempts at the Apollo uh, amateur night a couple of times and uh, didn't fare too well, but that's okay. At least I did it. I got over my, uh, my nervous fear of performing in front of audiences and I knew how the Apollo could be. So, <laughs> but uh, you know, they were kind of easy on me. Yeah, I never really, uh, never got into any bands or any other groups or anything. I would produce. Uh, there were some friends of mine back in New Jersey who I produced. They're young, uh, young guys, younger than me, and I produced a couple of songs on them. And so I always had my hand in music, <clears throat> but it wasn't until I met Larry when I was 18 
that uh, things started really taking off for me in a, in a big way. Cause we would tour and, you know, back then groups don't really have that now. I mean, the, there aren't really any bands out now anyway, but uh, back then we tour, we'd have our van and we tour in our cars. We would put all of our equipment in one van and sometimes we'd sleep on the equipment in the van and we travel. We do shows in New York City. We do shows up in Toronto, uh, upstate New York, you know, Rochester, Buffalo. Those are great spots. And we head out to Michigan and Grand Rapids, Flint, uh, Battle Creek. You know, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those kind of touring, a lot of work back then. You know, you call it uh, paying your dues, uh, so to speak. And during that time, it actually helped us to develop the stage presence. And what you saw at the Hollywood Palladium was just a direct, a direct result of our steady working and working out the fact that we weren't just gonna be a band that stood on stage and playing instruments, rocking back and forth. You know, that wasn't our deal. You know, we were always excited. Even when we did, you know, back then we were doing cover songs. So, you know, a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire, a lot of uh, how players, you know, a lot, a lot of that stuff. And in one place doing songs like that, you know, for me, it was like they just couldn't do it. It was impossible. So that was our uh, introduction. Do, do, you, do you happen to remember that, that Palladium show in particular, or is it just kind of blurred into all the rest at that time? I'm sorry, Scott, say that again. I said, um, did you happen to remember that Palladium show in particular? Or does it kind of just blur into the rest you were doing around that time? Oh, hold on. Scott? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry when I missed you. The internet connection where I am right now is a little janky, but uh, uh, I'm before. Uh, I was just asking about the that Palladium show, if you happen to remember that one or it kind of blurs into the rest you were doing at that time? To the rest of them, but you know, uh, very significant. And you said you just came from a P-Funk show. What was our penultimate show and actually tour was in 1977, when we uh, joined George and, and P-Funk on their flashlight tour. Mm -hmm. And we opened up for him, Marques and George and, and, the, and the, uh, the mothership and the whole thing. It was amazing for a guy who was in his early 20s to be on a tour like that was absolutely mind blowing because we opened up and we were glad to do it. Got 20 minutes on stage. We did, we did our thing and the Marques came on after and then George came on, and then after the show, he'd invite us all on stage. He'd go, cameo, Barquez, and we'd just come on and do the sing Mothership Connection, and you know, the crowd was going crazy, and it was just otherworldly. You know, it was, it was amazing. I can't, I, even that, that memory would always be one of my fondest and most uh, spectacular to remember because we did so well actually Scott that uh, during the show George flipped us in the Barquets and the Barquets wound up opening and we came on before George that's how the bar how, how the Barquets take that <laughs> well <laughs> I'm not sure how they did it I'm sure we were <laughs> privy to uh, their attitudes at the time, but we were just glad to be there. It wasn't our decision. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know, still today, you know, we still tour and laugh and, you know, have a great time when we see each other and when we do shows together. It's, and that's the other thing about this business and about the funk uh, fraternity and community. You know, we're all friends. We're all boys. We're all, you know, we've been doing this so long and, We've been doing shows together for so many years that when we see each other, like, uh, you know, Steve uh, Lakeside and we see uh, uh, 
guys from Confunction and uh, all the guys when we when we do shows together, SOS band. It's just so nice, man, to be to see each other. Because normally we don't see each other unless we do tours, you know what I mean? Unless we play together. And uh, that's something that I'll be always grateful for, for the, the community that we share in this in this funk, funk world. Wow, just, you know, going back to the mid to late 70s and being with that P-Funk, I mean, I saw them then and I can only imagine how mind blowing it was to be part of it because it was mind blowing just you know being present so yeah incredible yeah yeah it was very it was very and that and that i know uh in the early days we uh because we because we identified so much with george and uh the high players our early music was infused with that sensibility and I know rigor mortis, uh, uh, cardiac arrest was filled with weirdness and crazy thoughts about, you know, rigor mortis and postmortem and all this, all of this kind of crazy death, you know, thing, but it was funky. And I guess we got a lot of that from George and his, uh, and the way he approached music in uh, an irreverent, fun kind of way. And that's what we took away from our experience with, with P-Funk and the Ohio Players. And, and, uh, and when, we, when we finally started developing our own sound and our own, uh, the way we did things, It was very interesting to finally get into what we were doing, what what each member could bring to the table, you know. And I mean, Larry was an amazing drummer and a singer. And you, you know, back then, a lot of people couldn't play drums and sing at the same time. You know, that was something that was very unique. And uh, so, it was a total band. It was a band in its totality with the horns and everything. And like you mentioned earlier, you know, we did change up a little bit down the down the road because after a while, what I loved about music and radio and a lot of the record companies back then, they were a lot more open to uh to experimentation. They were a lot oh, a lot more open to bands taking risks and supporting that risk. And we were lucky to be on Casablanca anyway with Neil Bogart and 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 uh and on Chocolate City Records, uh Cecil Holmes. We were very lucky to be in that in that space. Actually the same the, the, excuse, the same label as as Parliament. Right. Exactly, exactly. So he gave us the space and no matter how crazy we came with stuff, he was like, hey man, bring it on, you know, bring, bring it. And we were very lucky to have and blessed to have several gold albums. And, you know, we sold a lot of records back then. And only because the record company supported it, radio stations weren't so narrow and their playlists as they are now. And it was a different time. And so we were lucky to be able to, to have the musical experimentation that we wanted to express. And at the same time, have radio and, and the, the labels and the fans appreciate it. Because even still today, Scott, I think that if if the music was presented to the fans and if it was brought out or, or made available, people would love it. They would, they, instead of having to be told what to listen to, let them experience it and let them make the decision on how they want to receive it. So those days are over, unfortunately, and shows like yourself like your show and 
uh, 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 internet radio and news for distribution kind of because people can still find the music and still experience the music. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, I'm happy for those areas, you know, because it helps guys like me who, uh, you know, in, in Cameo, you know, when we come out with something new, we don't have a label at the moment, but, you know, our, our things are going to be distributed by just like, you know, everyone else, unless you have a major label situation, but still distribution is going to be, you know, is going to be what it is. Yeah. Well, I know I'm, I'm very thankful for the internet in these days too, because I mean, that's how I discover so much of the music that I love. And, you know, I think just nowadays you have to be more proactive to go after what you want musically than you did back then. So, right. but if you do, you can be richly rewarded, you know, if you really get out there and look for it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Tommy, great stuff. I want to uh, step back just a little bit again. Okay. Um, and talk a little bit more about how when you, when Larry assembled the band uh, and you came on and Greg came on, um, how was the rest of the band kind of brought together and what was Larry like to work with then and, you know, what was his, um, how did he go about things? I mean, did he, we mentioned P-Funk, did he idolize like a George Clinton or, you know, how did, how did that come together? Well, no, see, actually Larry grew up in Harlem and he was in close proximity to the Apollo Theater. So he saw a lot of acts there and that, in, that informed his musical experience as well. Uh, James Brown, you know, a lot of the acts, uh, Sam Cooke, um, uh, a lot of the acts that, that were there were very exciting. And what he would bring to us, he was kind of like the architect in terms of how we were going to uh, present ourselves as a band. And we had regular musicians. We had musicians from New York, from the New York area. Everybody was from New York at the time. Uh, uh, it's hard for me to recall the names right now. But uh, other than Greg and uh, we had guys. Now, the early days we had some guys and then we, we, we in the early recording days, like on rigor mortis, when we started doing cardiac arrest, we had Gary Dow on bass and Eric Durham uh, on guitar. Uh, Nathan and his brother Arnett Lieutenant uh, were uh, we're on the horns, and then we had Wayne Cooper, who was a magnificent uh, singer. Uh, unfortunately, passed away back in the '80s, but uh, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal singer. And there's there was no one that could touch him. I mean, Philip Bailey was the closest uh, th that people would recall uh, comparing him to. You know. Uh, in terms of his first tenor and his range was just amazing. No one can touch him, you know. Uh, so that was our, that was the band that we formed when we recorded. So Larry was actually the guy who let everyone know that this is not going to be just a regular situation. We're going to be exciting. We're going to have stage presence. We're going to give the people something that, that they, they're going to spend their money, they're going to see a group that moves. They're going to see a group that's exciting. Because, like I said, we grew up on Earth, Wind and & Fire and, 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 and Ohio Players and all these groups and, and P-Funk who were movement. You know, they, they were exciting. And that's what we wanted to be. And if we were going to have six or eight or nine guys on stage, then they were going to move. So that was our, that was our mindset. And it started from doing the clubs to doing the shows. And like I said, that attitude is what brought us to now. Because even now, even today, you know, we have a show that's, that, that moves, that, that 
constantly. You know, your your eyes are, are looking all over the stage because you never know what's going to happen. So that's how Larry brought that, and we were excited to be involved in that. You know, in that in that uh, in the theory of movement, and then it extended into our stage gear. You know, what we would back then. You know, you had a lot of uh, spandex and all that crazy attire. And he used to say, well, why dress like, uh, why dress like the guy who's coming to see you? You know, they don't want to see somebody that looks like them. They would like, they, they want to be transported someplace. They want to be taken somewhere. They want to have an experience. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much why we developed our stage gear. You know, sometimes I look at videos of shake your pants and all and uh, we're going out tonight and, uh, and I look at these clothes and I'm going wow <laughs> and, and, the, and the hair too right oh and the hair oh uh, yeah the jerry curls and the whole <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah yeah the 80s and 70s were fun but uh that's 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 what we did you know it was almost like a on our on our uh, an organic type of transition because we didn't even think about it there was no discussion there wasn't any dissension there wasn't any uh well i don't know i don't know if i can do that man i don't know no we we all fell in line we all did it because i believe we were destined to be and to do that thing right there and the stars were aligned and everything converged in that time for us to emerge as that type of act and like i said that was the time for us that was cameo's time and it all was all happening so and that time at first was around 1977 so you know when funk funk first broke out and became such a big uh, radio hit you know and you started hearing it how, how was that how did that hit you what was like that reality like well, actually, the first single was uh, Rigor Mortis. And from that uh, Cardiac Arrest album. And I'm driving, I was driving down the street in New Jersey when it came on the radio for the first time. You know, Frankie Crocker had this. He was a BLS, WBLS uh, radio personality back then. Very huge and very influential. So he had this show called when he would introduce new music, uh, world premiere. So you'd hear world premiere in this echo world, world premiere. And you didn't know what you were gonna hear, but you knew it was gonna be something that you haven't heard before. So when I heard that, and then I heard, I don't see why you won't go won't have this dance with me. I'm like, oh, I pull up with a car, car over and I'm like, oh my gosh. The first time I've ever heard my song on the radio was mind blowing, right? So we all have stories. Larry's story is he was working in a clothing store in New York City, fitting a guy's pants. Same kind of thing happened. He's fitting a guy's pants. The song comes on the radio in the store and he's like, he calmly Apparently, according to him, he gets up, asks an associate, an, an associate in the store to take over for him to fix the guy's pants, and he walks out the store. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. Nice. So, yeah, that was it. Uh, so it was amazing. It's an amazing feeling hearing your song on the radio. And now it still gives me chills now thinking about it. Well, Cameo sure did get a lot of uh, radio play moving through the years. Um, you know, Rigor Mortis, great, great track. I didn't discover that until I got the album. On the West Coast, I'm not sure that they actually played that one. Um, but they play on the West Coast. That, that's, I'd, I'd be interested to know that. Yeah, I mean, Funk Funk is the one I heard. Um, and then really? I discovered Rigor Mortis by you know, that one. So, yeah. Wow. Oh wow! See now you're, you're you're giving me some some news because I had never known that. And the funk funk was big, 
because it had that Clinton-esque, Parliament-esque feel. And it was deliberate. You know, we had a bunch of songs on there that were very George uh, P. Funk inspired. <clears throat> and we weren't ashamed of it. I mean, George was our, George and the cats were our heroes, you know, and, and that's the model that we, uh, that's the model that we went after in our early days. So rigor mortis, funk, funk, all those songs on there. We had a couple of nice ballads on there too. And it, it was a it was a good album. I thought it was a good first album. It was a good first album, I thought. Definitely. Um, so tiny pictures here, but there's uh, the first three, Cardiac Arrest, and then we all know who we are and Ugly Ego. So uh, yeah. Tommy, I wanted to uh, get in a little more deeply into some of the records as you progressed uh, through the years. And, you know, we all know who we are performed better, at least my understanding compared to like ugly ego. But to me, ugly ego was more sophisticated in its sound and was, you know, had the band stretching out a little more in my opinion. Again, I'm just wondering, you know, your perception of that also, uh, ugly ego had more of a rock edge. Um, mm -hmm. whereas we all know who we are, uh, yeah, had that interesting animal heads, uh, cover concept. And it include the yeah. disco influenced uh, It's Serious. Yeah. Um, but Ugly Ego had Insane, which I still love today. So, what was going on at those times? We were experimenting with different sounds. And that's one thing that we enjoyed doing. We, uh, more than the actual song, uh, was the sounds that we were trying to be progressive we were trying to uh stretch and do as do as much to a particular sound as possible uh as far as ugly ego that did have a lot more of a rock edge and that was our first foray into the rock edge which we later on uh, got deep into with Alligator Woman. And we, we you know, we, we, we uh, advanced on that theme with Alligator Woman. <clears throat> and lyrically, we've always, see New York City definitely had a big effect on our music uh, in terms of the energy of the city and how we used that energy to infuse our music, our lyrics, our writing, and everything. So uh, I agree with you that We All Know Who We Are was a little smoother. It was uh, had a little smoother type of vibe to it. Uh, Ugly Ego was definitely a little more harder, a little harder, a little edgier. And we would bounce back and forth uh, with, that, with that vibe, you know. Were those actually recorded mostly in sequence, or were they kind of from same period and you just separated them out a certain way the uh, uh the albums yeah the tracks that ended up on those on those albums were they actually recorded like in that order for the most part or did you just kind of mix it up and uh, then separate them out yeah we mixed them up yeah we we definitely mixed them up we didn't record them all at the same uh uh we didn't record them back to back like that yeah, we would just record it. And there's a lot of songs that didn't make it. Uh, and back then, we only had, what, maybe eight, seven, eight songs on the record back then. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty, what was it, On The One? Which one, which, uh, you're going to have to uh, help me out a little bit on the, uh, on the discography. <laughs> <laughs> and you're wondering which album a particular track was on? Yeah. On the one? Yeah. Was that on the Ugly Eagle? Um, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can't say. Sorry. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So in 1979, keeping it going, Secret Omen came out. 
And to me, that one really showed a significant stylistic change going on in the band. Um, personally, I, it wasn't, I didn't think it was one of Cameo's overall strongest albums, but it did have two incredibly, um, I'll say one especially inventive cut in I Just Want to Be. Um, to me, at that time, you know, Cameo was sort of like, in that group, like you're saying, Barquets and the Confunctions and Lakesides. But that track, to me, just lifted Cameo to a new level of creativity and identity. Um, and then also, I really like Sparkle, that ballad on that album. So what was going on with you guys at that time? Well, I Just Want to Be just happened to be our first gold single. And... We were at a very creative period at that time. Anthony Lockett uh, came along and he uh, actually was the writer behind Sparkle. And vocally, we were really uh, reaching our peak and doing some very interesting things. I just want to be, just happened to be that very fun uh, track that uh, we wanted to experiment vocally with all the different sounds that we had, vocals that we had lyrically, the Wayne Cooper, uh, we mixed it up a lot there. That was, that was, that was very interesting uh, to, uh, to record that song. Yeah. Did you, I just want to be this fun. Did you feel like it was probably a hit right away or? No, you know, Scott, back then you didn't really know what was going to happen. You know, we would just record the songs and see what, ha what see how they would do. We knew that, that we knew that it was a fun, uh, different kind of song, different kind of track, and we had good hopes for it. But you never really know how it's going to hit, what's going to what's going to go on. Did you kind of come up with your own vocal parts, or did Larry say do this here, do that there, or how'd that work? No, we always collaborated on the vocal uh, arrangements. Yeah, Larry had a big part of it. Uh, luckily, he had the tools to be able to manipulate and to uh, place uh, the arrangement, to place the song, I mean, the, uh, the lyric and the vocal where he heard it, where he wanted it. <clears throat> so we, we all played a big part in that, uh, in the vocals. And who would come up with like those crazy squiggle sounds? And I mean, would Larry come up with that or Greg or? Oh, well, you know, the Quika sound on uh, I Just Want to Be was, was uh, something that I played actually. Uh, the, uh, it was uh, the African drum uh, with a stick uh, with a, uh, something like a bongo. And you just wet the stick and, and move the bongo between the, I mean, the stick between the, uh, the head of the bongo and make that ooh, ooh, ooh sound. And uh, Greg, back then the Moog synthesizer, Greg was a master at the Moog synthesizer. And we utilized those sounds to great effect on a lot of our songs. Uh, so yeah, that was, <laughs> that was an innovative, crazy song that I guess by that time in our in our in our development in our career, people were used to hearing songs from Cameo that were just a little bit left of center, you know. So when uh, when I just want to be came out, it was almost like the penultimate of our our crazy, you know, and it was accepted. We thank God for that because uh, it just catapulted us up, like you said, it just. I mean, still today, you know, people just go, wow, that song was, was, was amazing. It was. I mean, it was just one of those songs. There's a handful from that era, you know, like a flashlight or something that, you know, you just hear mm -hmm. that first time and it just kind of blows your mind because it's just totally different. Everything comes together and it's just yeah. Yeah. different and special. Yeah, and you had the low voice. I just want to be. You had the low voice, and then you had it. Yeah, well, you know, you had this. There all these different levels of, of, uh, of. Um, mm -hmm. You know, everything came together, but you had the different levels of of uh, of uh, 
of sound, what you heard. And that's one, that's another thing that while we're recording, when we record, thankfully, there was a lot more instrumentation back then. People played instruments a lot more. You didn't really, you know, they, they weren't the sampling or the looping and things like that back then. So you were able to experiment and, and actually have songs that had levels and, and, and peaks and valleys and things where you would, your, your ear would be pulled a certain way. You would never know, somebody wouldn't know what was coming next. Music today where it's just going on the same thing, you know, musically, you can, you can pretty much predict what's going to happen. Uh, so it allowed us to even experiment even more with vocals, textures, and uh, arrangements. So I Just Want to Be was, was, was that type of song where it would change. The changes were, were, were ridiculous and the vocals were just right along with that. So, yeah, that was a cool one. That was cool. And also just the test of time. I mean, I think it still sounds fresh. 